need someone to help. Someone who knows what it feels like. Who's walked through it. The pain can scar you. But it also changes the way you look around yourself. At the world. At people. Because no one's too broken for grace. That's what makes it grace. Well, once again, good morning. We are uh, happy to have you here on this Mother's Day. And as uh, Joseph said, happy Mother's Day. Uh, we are excited to have you here to celebrate all of you daughters and sons and grandchildren and whoever else you are that came with a mom. Of course, all you moms, we're happy to have you here today, too. Coming up at the end of our service, we're going to recognize our moms. Uh, but I thought about writing a special uh, blog post or article maybe on our app or coming up in the next newsletter, entitled, uh, Maybe Five Reasons Why I Don't Preach a Mother's Day Message Anymore. Uh, and, and I'll go ahead and give you the gist of it, because I'd have to sit down and come up with five reasons. It may end up being three reasons. I'm not sure yet. But I can tell you one reason. One reason is uh, there's nothing wrong with celebrating moms, but uh, I'd like to stick with what God's laid on my heart for us to learn today. And there may be you who showed up today that need to hear this next part of our message. And if I just talk about moms the whole time, you'll get a little feel good. We love our mom's message. And then you'll go off and do whatever you were doing before you got here. So I prayed about changing a couple weeks back, well, a couple months back when I was setting the calendar, the preaching calendar. And, and, uh, and I just felt like God was leading me to continue on the message. So I developed the series and then ordered the series based on those prayers. And today we're talking about abundant grace. And I thought, well, you know, if there's anything moms need, it's abundant grace. Because there ain't no perfect mom out there. So what a perfect day this will be. But also, if there's anything children need, it's abundant grace. In fact, if there's anything we all need, it's abundant grace. So if you're just joining us today, we started last week with the message, with the series, How is Genuine Compassion Developed? And this is about a nine-sermon series. It's going to be a while before we wrap it up. Because as I studied through it and planned out the sermon series, I kept coming up with these great ideas found in Scripture uh, to help develop genuine compassion. So if you're here for the first time or you're here as a guest and uh, you're going to be leaving, going back to your church uh, next week, I want you to pay close attention to this. In fact, I encourage you to download the app and follow the whole series as we continue preaching through them over the next eight, seven or eight weeks. Because at the end of this series, you will have been given... Multiple steps in your life to, be, uh, to, to develop genuine compassion. Uh, I think we're missing compassion in this world. I think we are compassionate to those who go through something that we've been through. But we're not very compassionate to those who are going, something that we, through, going through something that we haven't been through. Uh, up until I really began to develop a, or, or fight the battle of, with pain in my back and neck. And people often say, how is your back doing? And I... I I'm stuck between answering them truthfully or, or basically just summing it up with, well, it hurts sometimes, but it's okay right now. And the reason I say that is because nine times out of ten, when you ask how my back is doing in the last week, it's not just the back. It's somewhere from the tip top of the spine all the way down to the bottom of the spine. It covers the entire spine. The disease actually covers the entire spine. So, so sometimes I'm struggling with my neck pain. Sometimes I'm struggling with middle back pain in the T-spine area. Sometimes I'm struggling with the lumbar pain down in the bottom. And sometimes I'm struggling with pain in the legs, which is what I've been going through lately as a result of the spinal condition. And, and it wasn't until then that I dealt with this that I became compassionate with people, towards people. People would say, uh, you know, I was the kind of guy that somebody would say they missed work because of their back, and I would go, oh, they missed because of their back. What a big deal. Grow up and get in there. Man up, as my 13-year-old tells me. Man up and get in there. And, and, and I, I, I've thought about that often because there have been other situations where I have been a bit judgmental when I hear somebody's going through them. 
And then I experienced something along those lines and I realized how wrong I was at being judgmental. So what I'm getting at is that we need to give abundant grace. And so I want to ask you to flip to Matthew chapter 18. And while you're in your book, in your Bible, Matthew chapter 18, and there's Bibles in front of you or you can use your phones or, or if you don't have one, that's okay, just listen. In fact, this scripture is in the bulletin uh, in the middle, so you can always jot, uh, follow along with that if you wish. But as you, as you turn to Matthew 18, I want to tell you a story that happened about a year ago, I think. It was, it was when I was on vacation uh, uh, last time, and it was a vacation that we went away for. It wasn't a staycation. It was a get-out-of-town vacation. And we were at a relative's house, and things were okay. In fact, I talked about it shortly after coming back to church. I used it as an illustration. Things were okay, but this relative is the kind of family member that's very manipulative and judgmental, and if this person gives you something, there's always strings attached to it. You may know people like that. You may, unfortunately, be people like that. I hope not, but if you are, open your hearts to change, because that's no way to be. And so this, this family member has, has taken multiple family members to task for things that really weren't their fault, wasn't their fault, or it wasn't important, because she didn't get her way. She uh, was also a family member, has been a family member that has uh, rejected many people. When she has friends, she'll be good friends with them for a season, but it always ends in a big blow up, a big rejection, a big fight. Uh, she's the one member of our family that can't get along with everyone. You know, I, I often say if, 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 if you can't get along with Bill and you can't get along with Bob and you can't get along with Sue and you can't get along with Jane, it may not be all of their, them that have the problem. The common denominator may be you. You may be the one. In other words, I just can't get along with anybody. I hate everybody. Everybody's always out to get me and so mean. You might sit back and say, wait a minute, am I the problem? Now that takes a lot of, uh, a lot of swallowing of the pride, doesn't it? It takes a gut check to say, am I the problem? And many times people don't want to do that. Well, we ended up having a big blow up. We ended up having a, a big blow up. I'm talking the kind of blow up that had Heather mad at me. The kids were crying. And this family member and I were pretty much done with each other. I mean, a big blow up, like the kind of blow up that you don't expect your pastor to have. The kind of blow up that reminds your pastor how much he needs the blood of Jesus. That's, that's the kind of blow up it was. And, and so we're, we're, we're driving home and, and I'm saying things like I'm done with her. I, you know, she's dead to me. Saying these things that are hateful and hurtful and saying them to my wife, who's already upset because I've exploded. And she told me later, she said, that's not the man you, that may have been the man I married, but that's not the man you became. That's not the man you are now. So why, why did that happen? Well, as I did some reflection and really looked at it carefully, I realized that I had allowed this person to push every button and then some. You have to forgive me, this medicine that I'm on for my back makes my <clears throat> mouth very dry. So I'll be drinking a lot of that water today. But I, I realized that she pushed every button, and I let her push every button. In fact, I had given her control over me because I responded in a way that was not godly, was not Christian, was not characteristic of an ambassador of Christ. I gave no testimony as to how good God is and every testimony for how the devil was working. And so there came a time a few days later when she, or maybe a week later, when she reached out to me. And she apologized. Well, she didn't apologize. She apologized in her own way. You know people who, they don't come out and say, I'm sorry, but they'll say everything else but that? You know, those are the people that just cannot... Let, let me just put this on you. Since some of you are only here as guests today, and I'm thankful you came with your family, uh, but since there's the truth is some of you won't be here next week, I'm just going to lay this out on you and let you chew on it for a minute. If you're that kind of person, you are not leading an example that others want to follow. You're not living an example that others want to follow. You're not walking... As an ambassador of Christ in a fallen world, you're walking as an ambassador for the enemy, even if you're a believer. If you're living in contrary behavior that's contrary to Jesus. Right? You understand that? So if that's you, you need to get with that. You need to recognize that. Because I don't know about you, but I have a desire in my life to be a better man. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better father. I want to be a better pastor. I want to be a better man. And you say, well, how do you look at, what do you compare yourself to? Well, I don't compare myself to anybody around me. I compare myself to Christ and his example. And what he left for me in his word. That's how I determine whether or not I'm improving in the areas that I want to improve in. So if you're hearing something today and you're sitting out there and you're thinking, that's me. 
I'm that family member. I'm that person. I'm that person with all the pride in the world. I am so prideful, i got to tell everybody how humble I am. If that's you, open your heart to receiving this message and receiving the change that comes through a relationship with Christ. You may already be a Christian. You just may be hard-hearted towards that. Open yourself up to being pliable and allowing God to change you. So I got a phone call, and this was what she said. Can we just put everything behind us? Can we just put everything behind us and, and move forward? Now, I didn't want to because I was still mad. I, mean, I was deeply hurt and deeply upset, and I didn't want to. I'm just being transparent with you. But I said, yes, we can. We will put it behind us. Now, we've talked a few times since then. And I've been very loving and very respectful and very cordial. And I have forgiven her. I didn't forgive her that moment I hung up that phone. It took me and Jesus spending a lot of time in his word and a lot of time praying to be able to get to a point where the forgiveness was real. But when that forgiveness was finally given to her, it didn't free her up. It freed me. It freed me. One of my kids asked just today, and we were talking about this on the way here, and, but they've asked recently in the last few months as well, when are we going back to stay there for the week? The answer is we're not. <laughs> now, you might say, well, that doesn't sound like you've forgiven. Let me tell you something. There's a difference between forgiving and being stupid. <laughs> All right? If, I, don't, I don't read anywhere in Scripture where Daniel got out of that lion's den and said, let's go back for round two. <laughs> All right? He was done. He had enough. I, on the other hand, or on the same side of that coin, I have had enough. I, have, I am not going to put myself or my children into a position where we may get hurt again or I may be tested so righteously again. But that doesn't mean I haven't forgiven. See, the difference is when she calls, I'll take her phone call. I'll be loving and respectful. On her birthday, I will make a, an effort to reach out and say happy birthday. At Christmas, I'll reach out and say, Merry Christmas. When she sends the kids a gift, we will make sure the kids call her and or write a note because that's the right thing to do. We're not trying to impress her. We're trying to do the right thing. But there's nowhere in Scripture that says that forgiving somebody demands that you go back in that situation if it's toxic. You got to think about that. You got to remember that. Now, you can't be too quick. You can't say, well, they hurt me one time. So now this with us, this is this goes back decades. This is decades of stuff. This is not one isolated incident. If you came to my office and said, hey, I have an isolated incident, I'd say, is reconciliation possible? In other words, through your forgiveness, will she or he offer forgiveness? And can you build on that relationship? If you can, I say you should. But if you keep trying and you're giving an honest effort and you're honoring God with that and you keep trying and that person doesn't want to treat you right, at some point you have to say, I'm going to step back and I'm going to honor God with my prayers, my thoughts and the way I treat people. But I'm not going to intentionally put myself in danger of being hurt or responding in a negative way. So if you understand that. Then let's read what God's word says. And before you read, I want to ask you to consider this question. I've told you my story. Have you ever been in a situation with a family member or friend that did you wrong and it upset you so much that you could think of nothing except what they did to you? Yeah. All right. If you've been around long enough, you probably have. All right. Stand with me, please. We read the word of God this morning. Matthew chapter 18. We're going to start in verse 21 and go through 35. And here's what it says. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him, that's little Lord, in other words, his ruler, commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. 
But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and seized and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Having pay, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed to him. My heavenly father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Let us pray. Father, this is a special situation that touches the heart of everybody here in a different way. I pray, Father, that your word will speak, that you will make it clear to us through the Holy Spirit what you're saying to each one of us, and that we will walk out of here today having not just received the word from God, but prepared and ready to act upon it, to trust and obey as the hymn goes. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If you're not sure why we stand, we stand in honor of reading God's word. That's God's word. It's the authority in which we match everything else up to. When somebody says, I believe the Lord's leading me to do this, I tend to ask, did you find that in Scripture? If you found it in Scripture, then it may very well be, uh, it's proven. It's solid. But sometimes people will say that and they'll say, well, no, it's not in Scripture anyway. Well, then we've got to figure out if it's not in Scripture because... It's something that Scripture doesn't cover, which in some ways there are some things that are not specific to us today, although I think in a roundabout way you can find it if you search the Word. But anyway, that's why we stand, is because it's the Word of God and it's His instructions for us. Now let's, let's look back at the end of this. Some of you might be thinking, well now hold on Chester, if I think, if I read this, verse uh, 35, my Heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Does that mean that as a Christian... I can lose my salvation. I believe in Christ, but if I don't forgive, I can lose my salvation. Well, I'll tell you something. The answer to that is no, but I'll tell you something. A lot of my brothers, they preach that message. And they usually, they don't use that verse. They actually use from the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus is saying at the end there, he's saying, uh, if you do not forgive others, your Father in heaven won't forgive you. They use that verse, that version. And And they like to throw that out there and say, because, because here's what it did. When I first started studying that years ago, I got to this point and I thought, wait a minute. So I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I will go to heaven because all my sins, past, present, and future, have been forgiven. But if I die with unforgiveness on me, I'm going to go to hell? That doesn't make sense. Either I can lose my salvation upon every sin, or there's something I'm missing here. So I began to study it because I had my brother Baptist pastors who will stand in the pulpit and preach eternal security or once saved, always saved. They'll preach that time in and time again. And then they'll come to a verse like that and they'll go, but that's what Jesus said. So we got to examine what he said to understand it. First of all, understand the context. Jesus is talking to the Jews prior to the uh, resurrection. So this is prior to the resurrection. I'm I'm one of these people, you you can disagree with this, but, you know, it's fine. But I'm one of these people that believes that the Old Testament and the New Testament do not overlay with the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. What I mean by that is, as you read into the book of Matthew, you're still reading under the Old Covenant because Christ has yet to die and rise from the dead or be raised. So if you're studying that, what you're seeing is the Old Covenant actually still in existence in the New Testament. It's not until Jesus dies and is raised from the dead and then ascends into heaven fulfilling that part of the prophecy. It's not until then that the covenant changes. So Jesus is preaching to a group of Jewish believers who have followed him. Maybe some of them believe, some of them don't, but they're following him. They're out there listening. And he's preaching to people who are still under the law of Moses. They're still under the old covenant laws. So what he's telling them is he's saying, for you to live in freedom as a Christian, and he didn't obviously use that term, but for you to live in freedom through with God, in a relationship with God through me, You must obey all of the stuff God has taught you. Does it mean you're going to go to heaven or hell? No. 
But it does mean, or it can be argued, that if I'm not trying to live out the things that Jesus has told me to do, I'm either a stubborn Christian, a very immature baby Christian, which a lot of our churches are full of, or I'm not a Christian at all, I'm just trying to play a Christian. Works that, that, let me tell you something, if that meant, if forgiving others was a requirement to go to heaven, then salvation would be works based. And salvation is not works based. Salvation is based on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and your faith in Him. It's not based on how you live or what you do. But how you live and what you do is, should be a result of salvation. So if I get saved and I'm one of these people walks around and goes, because I know them. That's how God made me. No, no, that's not how God made you. No, if you're, a, if you're a jerk, that's not how God made you. That's the influence of the enemy, and that's how you're choosing to be. God made you in his image. Sin corrupted that image, and that's why you're the way you are. We needed salvation from the cross, from Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. Are you with me? Are you tracking? Okay, because I don't want you to get confused out of this, because that's a deep well we could go into for a long time. But what I want you to hang on to is that he's giving instructions for Christian living. In other words, even though our works based, uh, even though salvation is not works based, and we could go into what it does do and how the rewards in heaven are affected and all that some other time, because that's a really good topic for another day. But even though salvation is not works based, there are expectations for Christians. You hear me? If you're a Christian, if you are a believer in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, then there are expectations for you that come from the mouth of God. So we, he's saying, we should be living. In other words, let me put it in the the vernacular of today. We ought to practice what we preach. What's another one? We ought to put, put our money where our mouth is. That probably doesn't fit, but that sounds all right. What was that one guy said, Ed, if that don't like your wick, I don't know what does or something like that. Yeah, from a long time ago. So if you're really a Christian, you're going to tap in to the ability to forgive. And some of y'all have come in today with some stuff that you you thought, well, I didn't know he was going to bring all that. I wouldn't have come. (laughs) Well, I didn't know you were coming. (laughs) So I guess it's God, not me, right? Sometimes, but well, one thing we do around my house is we, we try to teach our kids not to say, and I actually I have to teach Heather this too because we're so used to doing this. And, and one day I just decided, hey, this would be a good lesson for our family. And so we started teaching it and we remind each other all the time of it. When one person does something to the other person to make the other person feel bad or to hurt them, we tell them, we, you know, we'll tell them you're sorry. Usually it's the, the kids. Usually it's Abe and Andrew fighting or something like that. And one of them will get into it with the other one, and, and we'll call them together, and we'll have, say, all right, now, what do you say? And, and they'll say, I'm sorry. And the other person's response is naturally to say, it's okay. Well, we've changed that narrative. We tell them it's not okay, but I forgive you. Why do we do that? Because it's not okay for Ava to punch Andrew. It may be justified, but it's not okay. So we tell her, we tell Andrew, because he's got a big heart, and he'll say, it's okay. No, we don't want her to think it's okay, because then later she'll think it's all right to do it. So we have to re- reinforce, it's not okay to do this. You're forgiven. That's the same thing Jesus is saying to us. He's saying it's not okay not to forgive somebody, but if you came in today with something in your heart and your unforgiveness towards somebody, he's saying it's okay. He's not saying it's okay. He's not saying it's okay. He's saying I forgive you. But he's also saying, now go out and do something about it. Go out and do something. You know, if you don't do this, you're going to miss out on the abundant blessings that God has for you because you're going to be living in sin, even as a believer. And the more things you do in your life that are contrary to the word of God and God's character and calling, 
the more or the less blessings you're going to receive. And it's not that he's withholding those blessings. It's that you're going to be blinded by the stuff going on in your life. Your anger, your resentment, your harboring ill feelings. That you're not going to see blessings when they come your way. And you're going to be in some pastor's office one day. Or some counselor's office one day. Saying, why is everybody else around here getting so blessed and I'm not getting blessed at all? And some pastor, if he's worth his weight, is going to say to you, where's your spiritual walk with God? And you're going to go, well, it's good. I mean, I do. I, I read my Bible. And he's going to narrow it down. He's going to say, are you tithing? And some people are like, oh, he can't ask that question. Well, I do. So <laughs> there's your fair warning. Because if you're having financial problems in your life, first thing I'm going to ask you is, are you tithing? If you're having relational problems in your life, I'm going to say, who haven't you forgiven? Who are you harboring ill feelings toward? Who do you resent for something they said or did in, in, against you or against a loved one? And if you're holding that in your heart, you're not going to be happy. You're not. One of the best things I learned to do was apologize. Why? Because apologizing frees me up of any responsibility thereafter. It may not free me up of consequences thereafter, but it frees me up of some responsibility. In other words, that sounds weird, but when I go up to Duke and I say, listen, man, I, I shouldn't have said it that way and I apologize. He had, now it's on him. The ball's in his court. He can either say, I forgive you, all is well, or he can be, you know, a jerk and turn around and walk off. Well, you know what? If he does that, turns around and walks off and doesn't take my apology, I then turn to God and say, well, God, I've done all I can do, so now I pray for you to soften his heart. And I don't walk away arrogant, y'all. I walk away thankful because I did what I had to do in order to make that right. And sometimes you find apologize. I'm going to tell you as a pastor leader, I take on more stuff that isn't my fault. And I just take it on me. Why? Because I can then go behind the scenes and help that person fix whatever it is so that they can grow. So I'm good at saying, listen, that's, I'll take that. That's on me. And as the pastor leader... If they are doing something within the church, it is on me. So in other words, I, this is my thing. Heather comes home, she's got a problem, I'm a fixer. Most men are. I say, tell you what, let, let's not talk this thing to death. Let's, how do we fix this? Guys, if that's you, ladies, if you have some of that in you, you will like that. Because that's what God's telling you to do. He's saying, don't dwell in it, fix it. Don't spend the rest of your life being mad or angry or upset at a, at, a, at a family member because they did something stupid or selfish, free yourself of that, forgive them if you did something wrong, apologize, then if you have to walk away, walk away holding your head high because you have honored God. That's one of the things about this church I love. Smith Street Baptist Church. I'm going to tell you this. It wasn't like that when I got here. Not really. But the folks here have embraced it. Most of them. I'm sure if there's people who haven't, I don't know about it. But we're not one of these people. I'm not one of these pastors who is going to hear about something going on between two people and not tell you to go make it right. I'm also one of these pastors that if two people need to come and sit down in my office to work it out and they need a mediator... I'm here. Let's go. Why? Because more, more than often than not, people have sat down in my office or sat down with our deacons, one of our deacons, or sat down with a trust brother or sister that they have here that leads them to reconciliation. And they and, and I've had people in my office say, like, well, I just I'm just so hurt by it. And they're so surprised when I say, Well, I understand that you're hurt. I don't understand you're hurt, but I understand that you're hurt. But I need to know, are you going to keep harboring this for the next six months and making yourself miserable and everybody around you miserable? Or are you going to follow the example of Christ and forgive? Because he forgave us and we didn't deserve it. That's what grace is. Abundant grace is that we deserve to go to hell and he died so that we would have an opportunity to put our trust in him and spend eternity in heaven. Put that up on the screen for me, the one thing I want you to know. Genuine compassion is developed by extending abundant grace. This is, our, this is our thing you need to know this week. In your life, if, you're not, if you want to develop genuine compassion, some of y'all need to develop some genuine compassion. Right? Some of y'all need to. Some of y'all, I, 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 God shows me all the time where I need to. I'll give you a case in point. 
Uh, I have never been one who would go out of my way to attend the funeral of somebody not directly in the church. Because otherwise, I feel like I'll be going to a lot of funerals. Because a lot of people have family members. If I skipped out on something, now sometimes I couldn't go because I had situations with my pain and things. But even that, I've taken charge of that and said, I may be high as, high as a kite from that painkiller, and I may not be able to drive, but by God, I'm going to go support the family. You know why? Because as I started to go to some of them, I started to see the impact that it made on people at that moment. They may never remember if I was there or not six weeks from now, but for some reason, they were impacted by their pastor going out of his way. So, so tonight, we're going to a visitation for the aunt of one of our members who died of cancer the other day. Tomorrow, we're going... Uh, Heather can't go. Ed has already agreed to drive me to the funeral in Baxley. Now, I'm not saying you can do all that. That's not for you. What I'm telling you is that's what God's laid on my heart. God has shown me that if I'm going to preach about genuine compassion, I better be willing to grow in that area. Amen. Genuine compassion is developed by extending abundant grace. Another example, somebody comes into my office. This is a hypothetical, but it might happen one day. They come, actually, I'll give you a, for, a, a real story. A person comes into my office one day. This person was working in one of our ministries, had a drinking problem. It hadn't crept up in many years. I knew about it. I was aware. We had talked about it. That person comes in and sits down, and this person says to me, sitting across the desk, I just have this need to confess to you. I said, well, okay. I, I said, first of all, that's not how we do it, but if you want to share, go ahead. This person said, I went to a wedding the other day, and I had a drink of a glass of wine i said okay now normally i would be like what, what's what's your point but I, I saw where this was going because i knew this person's history and uh and i said well how many did you have before you stopped and they said i don't know i lost count but i got really drunk at this point this person began to tear up had gone so long without drinking and was heartbroken by the decisions they had made to drink again we talked a little bit more and this person said I just wanted to come and tell you I felt like I needed to, to, to share that with you as a member of the leadership, you know, servant leadership team. And I said, okay, um, are you still drinking? No. Have you had anything to drink since that wedding? No. Are you going to keep drinking? No. Do you have a counselor to go to to help you get back on the right track to hold you accountable? Yes. What's their name? She shared the name with me. And I said, okay, well, I appreciate you telling me. And we just sat there staring at each other for a moment. And then she said, well, I guess I need to resign from my position, right? I said, well, let's open up to a story about a woman who was caught in adultery. And the Pharisees dragged this woman to Jesus, stones in hand, and said, we've caught her in adultery. It's time to stone her. Pronounce that judgment on her teacher. And Jesus kneels down in the sand and he begins to draw. And to this day, we don't know what he drew. We don't know if he drew the names of these men who had committed sins of the same kind. We don't know if he drew sins on the ground. We don't know what he drew on the ground. But whatever it did, when he looked up, it had caused all of those men to drop their stones and flee. And then he looked at the woman and his response to her was, go and sin no more. Amen. I looked at this lady and I said, if it happens again... Yeah, we're going to have to make some changes because you're going to obviously need some more help than what you're getting. But right now, thank you for telling me now. My advice to you is go and get drunk no more. Now, some churches would say she should have been brought before the church and thrown out on her butt. But Jesus doesn't teach it that way. He teaches abundant grace. He teaches if you can, now in some cases people fall morally and there's, you can still extend grace, but they can't go into that position again. I understand that. But we gotta, we're too quick to point the gun at somebody and pull the trigger when we've got our own things that God has given us grace daily for. Are you with me? Do you hear me? Because I just want to know how many of you are sitting out there right now thinking, I don't want to know it, so don't raise your hand, but I'm interested in how many of you are sitting out there right now and you're thinking, about a specific situation in your life that God's Holy Spirit is bringing to your attention that you need to give back to God and offer some forgiveness, some abundant grace on. Because if I, I know this is me, if I held on to everything that somebody, everybody did to me, 
I would never have a reason to smile. I wouldn't have any joy. And if Jesus compared the grace he gives me to the grace I give others, I'd get none. So I need to be, at one time I would have gotten none. So over that time period, God has led me to the place in my walk where I want to extend so much grace. My wife will tell me, you got to be careful. You're giving so much grace. You might end up looking like an idiot. I, I told her, if I end up looking like an idiot because I gave grace, then at least I gave grace. So what are you harboring today? You're not going to have genuine compassion for people. We're going to take up a special offering at the end of the service. It's the uh, Baptist Children's Home Offering Day. All 100% of the money given to the Baptist Children's Home will go to the Baptist Children's Homes for their ministries. I'm not asking you to, I'm not asking you to give a specific amount. But I am asking you to have some genuine compassion for those kids who don't have moms and dads or they, moms and dads are in jail or moms and dads just don't love them anymore. They never did. And so they got tons of brothers and sisters and they're having to live in, basically, if you've ever been out to Children's Home in Baxley, if you haven't, you should go and look at it. It's like going to a summer camp, but you're there all, all your life until you get shipped somewhere else or adopted. We, we get to, I get to go home. I get to hold my daughter. I get to hold her in my arms still. She's at that age where I don't know how many more years of that I'll get, but I'm taking as much as I can. Andrew's no longer at that age. It would be very weird and uncomfortable. But he used to be at that age. But I think about those kids. Those kids don't have that. Those kids aren't loved like my kids are. And it's Mother's Day. This gives you a chance to be a mother, whether you're a mother or father, to be a mother giving genuine compassion to kids that don't have the love of a mother and a father. Whether it's one dollar or whatever, every little bit goes to help them help their quality of life. They don't deserve what they're doing. They don't deserve that. But we don't live in a world that's fair. And we don't serve a God that's fair. We serve a God that is just. So to wrap up, I would ask you to do this. Put your mind on that situation. You all have one. Everybody's got one. I'm almost, con- almost convinced everybody's got one. Think about that situation where you need to give forgiveness. Maybe it's something you've been hurt really bad and it's going to take nothing short of a God-given miracle to get you to that place where you forgive him. Well, guess what? He's taking your phone call right now. (laughs) You can call him up and ask him for that miracle and he'll start to soften your heart. It may not happen today. It may take months of you praying every day, God, help me to forgive that person. But if you want to be the example of Christ in a fallen world, then you got to pick up the cross and walk with it. you got to take it and carry it you got to do like Jesus did. You can't just sit here in church and sing, trust and obey. No, you got to trust and obey. That's where the power of God is manifested in the people. It's when we trust and obey. It's when you can stand in a pulpit and talk about a story or stand in a meeting room or stand in your family's living room and talk about a story where you were harboring ill feelings until you gave it to God and you were so free. Because I'm going to tell you something. When I'm angry at somebody, it does not affect that somebody. They probably don't even know it. When I release it, it affects me greatly. I would encourage you to do the same. So here's your challenge. If you need to reconcile and apologize to someone, do it. Regardless of how they respond. Go to them and say, I'm sorry. And by the way, this is not an apology. I'm sorry that you made me do that. That's not good. Don't do that. That one doesn't work, okay? Uh, Also, don't put a but in there. I'm sorry, but I was really justified. I'm sorry that, oh, here's another one. Don't do this. I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings. You know if you hurt their feelings. If you don't, maybe you should ask, did I hurt your feelings? Because I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings is just another sneaky way to not really have to be genuine with your apology. And you're sitting there saying, well, preacher, you don't know. I don't have to know. I don't care to know. He knows, he understands, and he's got the directive for you. The imperative is for you to do it. The imperative is for me to do it. So let's do it. And I would tell you this, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. It does. Some of you may have never done it before, but the more you do it, the easier it becomes. But you're going to have to swallow your pride. 
And you're not going to get the blessings of God like He wants to with an abundant life here on earth if you're not obeying Him. I just want to say that again. If you cannot reconcile with the person, though, you still need to forgive them. You need to forgive them. And it may not be as simple as I forgive them. It may be, God, I want to forgive them and I need your power to help me forgive them. So now I'm walking with you. Strengthen me. Equip me to forgive this person for their, for their actions. And then I would encourage you in just a moment when we start the invitation to bring your problem to the altar. And you say, well, now, is that some kind of special magical place down here at the altar? No. No, you could actually do we could We could tell you to turn around and do it right in your seat. But here's the thing about coming out of, down to the altar. And nobody's going to know what your business is and nobody's going to ask. But you coming down here and praying that God will take that ill feelings, that, that stuff you're harboring and take it away from you, do you realize the courage it takes to get out of that pew and walk down here is, I would argue, nine-tenths of your battle? Because you're going to leave your pride in the seat and walk down here and pray at the altar. If you can't pray at the altar because of your knees or your back, come down here and pray the front row right here. I, I, I think that's why we have it empty all the time. I don't know. So come down and pray at the altar. Leave that problem here. Ask God to heal you. And your hard heart against that person. Then again, if you're not a Christian, this is your, your out. If you're not a Christian, don't expect to be able to tap into the power of God. Because only Christians can tap into the power of God. But if you're not a Christian and you want to tap into the power of God, which is the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you, that will equip you and empower you to do these things we're talking about, today's the day. Why wait? Yesterday at the funeral, I preached uh, Duncan Wallace's funeral. He was the 21-year-old who was killed in the car accident on 292 the other day. Most of you probably heard about it. I preached at his funeral. It was almost a full house over there at, at, uh, at Ron Hall. At the end of it, I, gave, I did something I've never done in a funeral before. I gave an altar call. Well, sort of. I asked them to lower their, lower their heads, close their eyes, and I prayed the sinner's prayer. I explained what it meant to believe in Christ. I prayed that prayer. And then I asked if anybody in here prayed that prayer for the first time. They, they have, don't pray it every time they're at church. They prayed it for the first time. And they truly believe in Christ and want Him as their Lord and Savior. And that was their prayer. Please raise your hand. And in that room, seven people's hands went up. Praise God. Glory. Glory to God. Now, whether those people meant it or not, you know, we'll see. But I pray that they were genuine. And I pray that their life eternal is going to be in heaven. So I'm going to ask you the same thing this morning. If you are not a believer, I'm going to ask you to come down front and tell me. I'll turn my mic off. Nobody will hear it. But I'm going to ask you to come down here among all the other people. And I know you're out there. And let me tell you something. There are always people who are going to stay in their pews. But I know there's people out there who need to come down and pray and give stuff to God that they've been harboring against other people in their life. So I'm going to ask you to come down here. And I'll be waiting for you. And if you want to give your life to Jesus, you've never prayed and asked him to be your Lord and Savior, and you want to do that, then he's waiting for you, and I'll be down here to walk you through that. Stand with me, please, if you will. Genuine compassion is not developed unless you give that grace we're talking about. So at this time... You've, given, you've been given your challenge. All those challenges are specific to you and your walk. You're either a Christian going through one of the first three, or you're not a Christian and you need to be a Christian. Because if you don't, and I'll tell you what I told those people yesterday, you go out of that funeral home and you might die. That young man did not expect to die that Sunday night. And nobody else expected it either. The only one who knew it was coming was God. Thankfully, he had made that decision at a young age to be a follower of Christ. Have you made that decision? Because you may walk out that door and a car may get you, a heart attack may get you, you might choke on your lunch. And that's, that happens. And people die and they go to hell. I'm not trying to scare you, just telling it like it is. That's my job. So if you would like to come down and give your life to the Lord, come down and get me. If the rest of you who are Christians would like to come down and leave that problem at the altar, come down now. But whatever you do, don't ignore the Holy Spirit. Come as he leads you, please.